as Deb said earlier, uh, we, we all get excited about things, and there are things you just can't wait uh, to tell anybody. Uh, the other day, um, my, my friend on Facebook found, uh, went to see the new Star Wars movie, Solo, uh, and he's kind of a Star Wars geek and, and loves all that. Uh, and he had no problem telling every single person uh, in, in every branch of social media that they had to go to see the movie. Right? It was more than just, hey, that was a great movie. It was like, no, no, no. Drop what you're doing and go now. Like, you have to see it. And you probably have done that, maybe, right, with something. Uh, maybe it was a movie. Maybe it was a book that you read. Maybe it was, uh, for me, it's, it's music. Uh, I'll be like, yeah, you got, you got to go, go to iTunes right now and, and go and grab this, download it, listen to it. It's, it's awesome. It's going to change your life. Uh, and we do that with things because they're exciting. And, the, and here's the weird thing about it is that you don't, they worry really about whether people are going to think you're crazy, do you? When it's something that passionate? Like when you got engaged, ladies, remember that? You had no problem showing everybody the ring. Oh, look at that, I got engaged. No one had to tell you to go and, 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 and let everybody know that your first child was born and the second and the third. Uh, doesn't matter. You'll tell a perfect stranger, hey, you got to see the pictures. Look, look, isn't she cute? And the guy's like, dude, I just work at the, uh, at the Acme here, okay? I don't even know you. Uh, and you're like, but, but, but I'm so excited. Like, everybody's got to know. Everybody's got to see it. Everybody's got to know about it. It's so important. And, and I'm with Deb. I, I'm wondering why we don't get as excited when it comes to the thing that matters more than anything else. What God has done for us and Jesus, it's like, it's like suddenly I'm worried about what everyone's going to think and their reputation. And when it comes to a movie or, or my family or other things, yeah, I don't worry at all. But when it comes to the most important thing, right, eternal life, knowing that I'm saved, knowing that I'm forgiven, I'm like, well, I don't want to be seen as some kind of religious nut. Boy, they're going to think I'm pushy. And I got to tell you, like when I, when I first came to faith, um, I, I drove my entire house crazy. I drove my mom crazy. She'd be like, you know, man, you're just, it's all you talk about. And I'm like, yeah, that's it. And I kind of hope to never lose that, right? But there's times where, where, where it might not be that I'm ashamed, but sometimes we're just too busy. Got too much going on. I got important stuff to do. But the reality is that that no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, if, if we're believers, we're, 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 we're not just to be talking about it, but it, it's like what we're supposed to be doing. It's who we are. Paul says it over and over again in this series that we've been looking at. Uh, I remember coming, when I came across the readings, I thought, you know, you know it, it's, it's, it's in 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, and, 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 and Paul's language is so strong about not giving up, about not losing hope, about not stopping to tell, right? Not, not letting up at all when it comes to telling people about Jesus. And I thought we've got to get back to that as a church and as people that, that we, we're going to say, look, we refuse. Like today, we refuse to, to, to look at and, and to let the present circumstances dictate whether we're going to tell someone about Jesus or not. We refuse to, to look at life and go, this is all there is. Like, I refuse to see work as just work. I refuse to see school as just school. It's not. It's not. All the other stuff is secondary to being a witness to what God has done. It's a way of letting the world know. And I'm not talking about manipulation. I'm not talking about, you know, all those other things. I'm just talking about being who we are, which is believers in Christ. Our lives have been changed. We, we are no longer lost. We have been found. We are no longer dead. We are alive. So what does Paul say, right? 2 Corinthians 4. Let's open up to that. It's the uh, second reading. If you want to just uh, look at your bulletin. Otherwise, if you've got a Bible, there's black hardbacks there. Um, uh, we're, in, we're in 2 Corinthians 4, and we're going to move over into, into verse 13. Now, we've already had some amazing stuff. Paul says that, that God has, back in uh, verse 6, that the same one who in creation said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts. 
gave us the knowledge, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. I mean, we have that. That's who we are. That's what we have. And so when Paul goes in, in, in verse 13 and says, it is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken, he says, with that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Now, what is he quoting? Right? Because he doesn't say. He doesn't say, as it was written in, in, in Psalms 116, verse 10, uh, I believe, therefore. Right? Hopefully your Bible has a little footnote which helps you. He's referring to David. And David was very similar to Paul in terms of his life experience. If you go back to the Old Testament and you look at David, David's own son tried to take over uh, and, and, and steal the, the, the throne from him. That's bad. That's like Game of Thrones kind of etiquette and ethic, right? It's bad. I know it's probably a show we shouldn't watch, but, but boy, uh, the Old Testament with David's family, it's kind of similar. It was a little cutthroat, literally. Come at you, take you down. I mean, that was, that was his road. And, and, and he dealt with persecution. He dealt with the then king, right, Saul, uh, who, who wanted to kill him in so many places. And so what does he say in Psalm 116? It's pretty amazing. He says, I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. And you know what that verse means? That means that the Lord of the universe, who makes everything and is currently active in, in, in making sure everything is running smoothly, is never too busy when he need, knows that you need him, he turns his ear. In other words, he's, what? Like, 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 I, I might think I'm like the most insignificant person in the world, right? I, you might think that, like, who's going to notice me? But the Lord of the, what he's saying is the Lord of the universe thinks I'm significant enough that he wants to hear what I've got to say, and he wants to know what's going on, and because he's there to help. He's there to rescue. He's there to, to save me. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's going, that's my experience. The cords of death entangled me, right? The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. And I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, save me. He is gracious. He is righteous. He is full of compassion. He protects the simple hearted. When I was in great need, he says, he saved me. So be at rest once more, O oh my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. So when he gets to verse 10, he says, I believed. And it wasn't just that it was like this book knowledge that he had heard about. Oh, yeah, I've read, you know, what happened, what he did with Moses. And I took my history lesson in, in biblical theology. And, yeah, I know what God is all about. He's like, he's like, actually, life looked impossible. It looked like I was going to die. It looked like they were going to take me out. And God saved me time after time after time. And so, you know what? In this passage, he says, I believe, therefore, I said that I'm greatly afflicted. And in, in my dismay, I said, all men are liars. So what he's saying there, and it's kind of weird, like, like what's he talking about there? He's going, look, I, I can even say that, 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 I'm, that I'm hurting, right? I'm afflicted. Everyone around me is lying to me. And yet I can still call out to God. See, a lot of times we think that, that God's going to hear us if things are going great, right? You know how we look at it? It's a little, it's a little more difficult when, when it looks impossible. Paul's going, David's going, look, when I was surrounded by people who all wanted to kill me, who wanted to hurt me, and wanted to take me down, I could still say, God, I could complain to you and you hear me. I could bring this to you and I know that you're on it and I know that you can handle it. And that's exactly what was happening with Paul. If you go to Acts 23, there's, a, there's an interesting story in there. If, if, you're, if you're wondering if Paul ever had it difficult as well, it's why he quotes David, because he's had some own, his, of his own issues. We know Paul's backstory. We talked about it. Again, a murderer, uh, tried to kill Christians, succeeded in a lot of cases, tried to jail them. Was, that was his thing. I'm going to take down the church. I'm going to take down Jesus. We're going to make them stop telling about him. He is changed on his way to do that. God totally changes his heart, totally changes his mind. He is now a believer, a follower of Christ. 
And guess what? All his buddies are now trying to kill him. I mean, I mean, who wants to sign up? Anyone want to sign up for that? That's, that's rough. But what his point is that even if it's that bad, God's, God's with you. He's, he's going to give you the strength. He's going to give you the power. Because here's what Paul was up against. You ready? In, 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 in chapter 23, verse 12 of Acts, he says, The next morning, the Jews formed a conspiracy, and they bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 men who were involved in this plot. I think it's the understatement of the century to say that Paul may have been a little discouraged by that email. Wouldn't you? Yes. Right? I mean, my, my biggest thing is I didn't get enough likes on my Facebook post. Right? Some people may have been a little critical. He, he's getting an email going, there's 40 dudes that are not going to eat until you are dead and buried. In fact, they went to the chief priests and they went to the religious guys and they signed off on it. They like blessed your, your endeavor. Yeah, you go. Bring me his body, right? I mean, that, that's what they're doing. This is what he's up against. And you know what he says? He goes, I am not going to let this, this plot, which was probably pretty close to when it was happening. Okay? Do, 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 are you tracking with that? Like, this is the same guy. Who says this? I believe, therefore I have spoken. Because that same spirit of faith that, that moved David to speak and Moses and all those other guys is working in us. And so you know what? We're following their footsteps. We're also going to speak. And we're going to refuse to stop speaking. Why? Verse 14. We're back in 2 Corinthians 4. Sorry, I'm jumping around. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4. Uh, in 14 he says, look, here's why. Because we know... We know, more than anything else, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. So what Paul's saying, he's saying, look at all the people in that church. He's like, look, it's not only that you have like a historical knowledge of what that Jesus rose, but you believe it. I believe it. We all believe it. And guess what? Jesus is coming back. And he's going to take us all, and we're going to stand in front of the throne of God, and, and we're going to have Jesus right there going, hey, here's one of mine. That's the assurance. It's not like I have to go up there and i got to pass a, you know, a, a 500-question survey to get into heaven. He says that, that, that he's going to present us with Paul, with all of them. In God's presence, in the Father's presence. So he says all of this, all that he's doing, the, 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 the danger that he's in, all of the trouble, all of it, he said, is all for your benefit. So that this grace that is, has, is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. I think this should be the the. The, uh, the position of the church. Instead of going, oh boy, we got churches closing, we got, we, got, we got people coming against the church, you know, Paul would go, okay, cool. That means we're going to keep going. We're going to look past this momentary thing, past this, this thing that's a, that's a, that's a, a bit of a, a bump in the road. Why? Because he's keeping his eyes on the prize. Notice how it's all for their benefit. Paul's like, I know I'm saved. I know that God loves me. I know that Jesus died. I know my sins are forgiven. I want you to know that. Right? And, and, and that should be my heart. That should be your heart. That, that, that everything is for someone else's but That they might know. That they might have that hope. That they might not ever have to feel like they have to give up hope. But they would know so that, that grace gets to them and reaches them. Shouldn't the goal be that the, that the very halls of heaven are, are overflowing with the glory of God because of what's happening? Because people's hearts are, are, are being changed and their lives are being changed and now they have hope and now they have Jesus? I, I, I want to be able to hear the hallelujah, don't you, from, from heaven? Like, yeah, look at what they're doing. Look, look how many people are hearing this. So he goes, so therefore we don't lose heart. 
even though he doesn't sugarcoat it. He's like, outwardly we're wasting away. Outwardly we're a mess. Outwardly this is hard. This is difficult. We're getting beaten up all the time. It's terrible. But, 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 here, but here's what matters. He, ref, I refuse, he says, I refuse to look at that outward stuff. Look, because inwardly God's doing something. He's renewing us day after day, day by day. Listen, look, 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 look at how he frames his, his, his schedule. Right, the beatings and the, the jailing and all that stuff. He goes, he calls them light and momentary troubles. I don't know about you, but if I come home, listen to this. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll, I don't, I'm going to single John out, but uh, John gets home from work uh, and, and, he, and he tells Jennifer, he says, Jen, um, I, we had a, a hostile other, other business came over and, and they tried to take us down and we got into it, right? Because he comes home, he's all tattered and beat up. Right, and, and um, is he going to call that a light, or is she going to consider that a light and momentary glitch? She's going to be like, what, the, what happened? I mean, it's serious. He sees it as a light and momentary trouble. He's like, yep, it's another day. Doing my thing. It's terrible, but, but we're there. Here's why. Because, because it outweighs the eternal glory. It outweighs all of it. It, you can't even hold a candle to it. So, so he says, so what we do is we fix our eyes on what, we, on, what we, uh, on what is seen. We don't fix our eyes on that, but on what's unseen, on forever, on eternity, on what God is and who he is. Because all that other stuff is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. See, that's what's at stake. That's, that's what is out there. And, and, so, so, and so we have the greatest news. Why don't we tell it? I want to end with a, a quote from Penn Jillette. Uh, you may have heard this before. Uh, it was a big thing on the internet a, a couple years ago. Uh, he's the Penn and Teller guy. You know what I'm talking about? He's the guy that actually talks, the real tall guy. And, um, and he's an atheist, doesn't believe in God at all, at all, which is what makes this so shocking is what he said. Um, evidently, uh, someone at one of his Vegas shows had given him a Bible. And, and the, guy, the guy just came out and said, hey, you know what? I, I've, I've seen this show a couple of times. I love what you do. I just, this is so important to me. I want you to have this Bible. And he said, you know what? He said, he said this. He, he, was so, he was so impressed with this guy. And you would think an atheist would get upset, would be kind of like indignant. Like, how dare you try to change me? Don't you know what I believe and what I, or what I don't believe? And why would you push this on me? You know what he says? He says this. He goes, look. He says, I always said, I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. Did you hear what I said? People who don't proselytize, he goes, I, I don't respect them. Here's why. Because I don't respect that at all. I believe that, he says, if you believe that there's a heaven and a hell, and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who, who think people shouldn't proselytize and who say, just leave me alone and, and keep your religion to yourself. He says, how much do you have to hate somebody not to proselytize? How, how much do you have to, to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? And I, when I first heard him say this, he did a little video thing, and I was like, <gasps> like the air left the room completely. Because we're always like, oh, yeah, they don't wanna, I don't want to bother them. They're going to they're gonna get angry with me. I'm going to get into an argument. It's not. It's not an argument. And he said, this is what he says. And I'll finish with this. He goes, he goes, I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that truck was bearing down on you, there is a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. If, if a guy who doesn't believe in God gets it to that level in a sense of how, how important this is, see, he's framing it in a way that, 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 that I, I have to take notice. See how important this is. See, that they might have what we have, that people might know what we know. Yeah, I think it's just too good for me, to, for me to keep to myself. I pray that for all of us, for the church, that we refuse to keep it to ourselves. We refuse.